I have miles and miles ahead of me Tales to listen to, time to spin Up ahead the road is thin Wonder what's around the bend Hello, I'm Charles Kuralt. We're off again to meet a few people on the back roads of America. These are people you know, not from the front pages. They've never been on the front pages. They're people you know from next door and down the block. Their stories are some of my favorites from 25 years on the road. All right, off we go. Not just to see the sights this time, but to see the heights. We'll travel to some of the great mountain tops of the world in search of what the heights can teach us. And look here, many would consider this the height of folly. In Newberry, Ohio, Father James Moran insists that all the students at the school of which he is principal learn to ride the unicycle. You know what? It helps them scale the heights of life. As for musical heights, we will consider the case of the Star-Spangled Banner and of Julie Rose Grant of Putney, Vermont, who'd just as soon return the rocket's red glare. Thank you very much. But another height, first of all. We're about to introduce you to something that began in a bell tower but has long since come beautifully down to earth. <laughs> Meet Eileen Lawrence. Does the name ring a bell? Well, the name may not, but she rings a bell. These people also ring bells. These are the members of Eileen Lawrence's Handbell Choir. <laughs> and these are members of two dozen or so other Handbell Choirs. Everybody here rings a bell, or two or three or four. This is the Hudson Valley Handbell Festival in Briarcliff Manor, New York. More than 300 handbell ringers are about to ring many hundreds of little gleaming and big booming bells. That is why they are here, to make one great instrument of themselves. But there are things we need to know first, and Eileen Lawrence, surely the name rings a bell now, is just the person to explain. Let me get a glove on. I don't want to get fingerprints on the bell. These are called English handbells. And English handbells were invented when English people wanted to practice change ringing and not bother the neighbors. Because what they were doing was learning how to ring these patterns of sounds. And when they made a mistake, the whole countryside heard them. So these little bells were forged, and then the ringers could actually take them home. And they would sit around in a little circle. And they would practice their changes together in a circle. Change ringing is ringing bells in a certain mathematical order. But then they got a little bored with that. And they said, you know, that mathematical business is all fine and good. But with the same bells, you can ring three blind mice. And you can also say, row, row, row your boat. And they said, well, let's ring songs. So they started to ring songs. And then it developed into more complicated ringing. So they could ring two bells at the same time. They could ring chords. They could involve a lot of other people. And they could ring a whole score of music. 
But bell ringing is about something more than music, too. Listen to Eileen Lawrence's ringers. My mom has played, my dad has played, my older brother Tom has played, my younger brother Chris has played, and my grandmother has played. <laughs> all, in, all in different choirs. Well, I'm the oldest of four, and I ring bells, and <clears throat> my other sister, who's even, she's six, she can even ring a bell. Let's start at 52, please. 52. Bell ringing is about something more than music. Bells have been rung all along, of course, to signal joy and sorrow, war and peace, danger and all clear, leave takings and homecomings. Well, I just want to say that I know that when I'm in church, you know, and it's like a Monday night and it's snowing outside and it's winter, and I have a lot of homework to do, except for I'm playing bells. I feel so peaceful and I don't know, I feel like really close to God when I play bells. Imagine the sound not of this one choir alone, but of many choirs ringing together. Well, no need to imagine. We're ready now to go back where we began, to the Hudson Valley Handbell Festival, where everyone rings a bell. Bells have rung out grief and gladness, bright news and dark, comings and goings, in the right hands, and all these many hands are the right hands. Bells can also do this. When the piece comes together, you're just flying high. Yes, yes. <laughs> and you'll never feel that anywhere else. connected. Everybody in the whole world, all humanity is connected. And the harmony of bells enforces that connectedness that we have. So that you can look on a floor with ringers from all over the world and you can say, that's God's children. And God's children are making a joyful sound. The last thing Tim Burke ever thought he could do is ride a unicycle. But then he fell into the hands of a promoter, and now he's in hot competition with all the other kids at St. Helens School in Newberry, Ohio. They all ride unicycles. The early morning rush for classes under these astonishing circumstances becomes a psychedelic maze through which unmounted teachers wander at their peril. You may wonder justly at this point, What's going on here? Well, it's just that the man who runs things around here figures that life is full of bumps and bruises and that the young should discover that in their youth. And being a promoter by nature, Father James Moran promoted universal unicycle riding for every kid in school. Don't you worry terribly about the kids getting hurt? No, my mother never worried about me. I did everything and I fell and I got knocked down and I never got hurt. In the if I did, my mother would have taken me to the doctor. And that's what happens with our people here. 
Somebody's hurt, they take them to the doctor and get them fixed. They don't worry about it. I should think the parents would worry a little bit, though. Well, I believe some of them do. But what are they going to do about it? <laughs> they either take the kid out of St. Helens School or he or she rides a unicycle. So what are they going to do? It's a question of making a kid do something to, to, to bring out what, what's in him. Any boy or girl can learn to ride if he's got the determination. And of course, that's why I like it. His mother can't do it for him, his father, he's got to do it. And when he gets through, he's done it. He's accomplished something, he's proud of it. And from this goes on, he finds the things in other life he can do the same way. This all fits right into the American idea of leisure. Every graduate of St. Helens for the rest of his life will be able to spend his spare time doing something wonderfully difficult and silly, a skill gained in Father James Moran's School of Hard Knocks. When they sing the Star Spangled Banner, New England stands at attention. Patriotism has always been sincerely felt here. But sooner or later, somebody had to do something about the rocket's red glare problem. Some singers can hit those high notes, but not many. The fact is, our own national anthem is a song almost nobody can sing. Robert Goulet, who forgot his lines at the Clay Liston fight in 65. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early night what so proudly we hail? From her perch on a Putney, Vermont hilltop, one 72-year-old grandmother has decided to do what she can to change that. The Star Spangled Banner, says Julie Rose Grant, is not only unsingable, it is also blustery and warlike. Just not the kind of song we ought to stand up for anymore. She has persuaded the Putney town meeting, which voted to change, to America the Beautiful. That leaves only the rest of the country to persuade. It's hard to sing. If, if you didn't have anything else against it, you could add, you'd have just that thing. It's hard to sing. At the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars... The Star Spangled Banner has been our anthem only since 1931. It doesn't have such deep roots. But even if it did, if it was much older than that, I think the time has come for us to recognize that it is not a good anthem for us. Aretha Franklin. In a... I would live with it if we didn't have something better. The flag was it does something else that I think is peculiar. Do you know of another national anthem that begins with a question or ends with a question? Oh, say. to the point in our lives, I think, in our country's lives, where we don't look upon war as something that we send our young men off to in, with song and with flags flying. It's also a, a song, the, the melody to which we sing, it was pirated. It was something called to Anacreon in heaven. Anacreon was a Greek lyric poet who wrote of wine and song, and uh, it has no place in our modern uh, America. The national anthem was a drinking song? Yes, it was. And I'm told that, it, that a few under your belt makes it possible for you to reach the rocket's red glare if you, if you try hard enough. Are you having fun with the campaign? I'm having a delightful time. Really delightful. I've gotten letters from, uh, well, I guess at this writing, it's people in 28 states of the Union. One man has written to me against America the Beautiful. He feels that we have to be strong against the Russians and the Chinese. He says that America the Beautiful is too sweet, 
that uh, we've got to put up, put a, 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 a tough stance. Well, I'm not exactly sure how you do that in song, but, uh, and I answered his letter, and uh, he wrote back and thanked me for my courteous reply, but I'm still wrong. The first verse oh, is, beautiful Oh, beautiful for spacious, spacious skies, skies, for amber waves of grain. waves of grain. Purple mountain Julie Rose Grant invited the parson of the church down the road to drop by and sing America the Beautiful for us. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good. Julie Rose Grant can see those amber waves of grain. As the Reverend Michael Henkel sang, she sat there beaming. That was beautiful. How proud I'd be to stand up for that. Mountains have a hold on us. They draw the human eye and make the human heart beat faster and fill the soul with awe. Where did Moses talk with God? On a mountaintop. Let's say you're a Mesopotamian of 4000 BC about to paint the first known landscape. What would you paint? mountains on either side of a river. And when the sun god rises on the ancient seals, where does he rise? From among the mountains. To the Chinese, mountains were the cosmic pillars that connected heaven and earth. When you died, if you were lucky, your soul rose into the mountains, and there it found the paradise of the immortals. Early Europeans, on the other hand, took one look at the mountains and stayed away. The wind-blown peaks didn't look sacred to them. They looked demonic. This wall of eagle-baffling mountains, Shelley wrote. Black, wintry, dead, unmeasured, without herb, insect, or beast, or shape, or sound of life. If you come from gentle Sussex, as Shelley did, your first alp can nearly scare you to death. But with the Renaissance in Europe came curiosity and a new reverence for nature. People ventured into the mountains and found no demons, only beauty. In art, the stylized boulders of the old religious paintings became jagged peaks in the works of artists like Domenico Veneziano. And the great da Vinci himself, after an expedition to the Alps, gave Mona Lisa a mountain backdrop. When American artists went west in the 19th century, they brought back canvases of the Rockies and the Sierra, so filled with light and majesty that they practically guaranteed a westward migration. And now at last, we mortal beings have made our peace with mountains. Not many of us in America or Europe are lucky enough actually to live up here. Mountain towns are always little towns, Aspen or Angel's Camp or Albertville. The commerce of the world takes place in great cities of the seacoast or river bottom. But to come to the mountains is to think that maybe the Chinese got it right. Here, halfway between earth and heaven, is a kind of paradise where summer fields of flowers give way to winter fields of snow. Most of us are prisoners of the plain, envy the shepherds and herdsmen and hermits who dwell in the folds of the great ranges. Suddenly up here comes to mind the state motto of West Virginia, Montani Semper Liberi. Mountaineers are always free.
Well, time to say goodbye until our next trip together. We've heard about a story up the road here, but we kind of hope we never get there. With luck, we'll stumble upon something more interesting along the way. I can see the road is bending. Wonder what's around the bend. All these years I've been a wonder Just when I think I'm near the end I always see the road is bending And I wonder what's around